with that, I'll call the um, <clears throat> January 25th, 2021 water board meeting to order. Um, the first item is the um, roll call. Can you please do that, Heather? Sure. Todd Williams? Here. A little, um, Allison Gould? Here. Kathy Peterson? Here. Roger Lang? Here. And Scott Holwick is uh, not here yet. We'll see if he'll be able to join us in a few minutes. For city staff, we have Ken Hewson. Here. Uh, Nelson Tipton. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Heather McIntyre is here. Francie Jaffe. Here. And Price Hadley. Here. And Council Member Martin. Here. All right. Chair, you have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Um, Scott had a mediation today and said he may be joining us um, a little late. So Scott Holwick may be joining us here at, at some point during the meeting. Um, <clears throat> the, the next item is the approval of the previous month's minutes. Um, has everybody had a chance to review the December 21st, 2020 meeting minutes? And if so, is there a motion to approve those? So moved. Okay, Roger made a motion. Um, is there a second? Kathy, yeah. second that. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, it carries four to nothing. Um, the next item is the water status report. Wes, are you doing that? Oh, okay, Nelson, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead, Todd. Um, so the flow of the Safe Rain Creek at Lions Gauge at noon today was eight CFS, and the uh, the twenty four year historic average is uh, fourteen CFS. So we're a little bit down from the from the average. Um, the fall in Safe Rain Creek is Highland Lake, and the admin number is eight thousand nine seventeen, uh, with a priority date of uh, May thirty first, eighteen seventy four. Um, call on the main stem of the South Platte River is North Sterling Canal, admin number 26,302.23953 with a priority date of 1-5-1922. Um, Ralph Price Reservoir Button Rock Preserve is all but full um, due to uh, scheduled outlet repairs. And uh, Union Reservoir is at 20.2 feet, full is 28 feet, so it's down approximately 5,000 feet or 5,000 acre feet, that wasn't clear. And um, snowpack for South Platte uh, Basin is 77% of normal and the, the snowpack for the uh, upper Colorado Basin is 70% of normal. That's all I have, is there any questions? It's, it's dry, very, very dry. So we need to get some snow. So everybody put your, do your snow dance and snow hat or whatever you you do <laughs> i'll do it all <laughs> oh but we are it is dry okay any questions or comments i know wes is probably gonna in the water supply update i'll yeah. be getting into the snowpack in a little more detail but he will questions on on current flows that sort of thing okay i don't see any so we'll, we'll keep moving along here all right thanks um, item Item five is public invited to be heard in special presentations. Heather, is there anything on that? We do not have any community members who wanted to make public comment. And I don't believe we have any special uh, presentations this time either. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, any, you know, I don't know if Ken, this is yours. Any agenda, agenda revisions or submission of documents? I have none. Okay. Okay. We'll keep on moving. Item seven is development activity, which... It does not look like there's any, is that correct, Wes? That is correct. Okay. So on to 8A, which is um, the designation of posting place for board meeting notices. Wes? So each year, Water Board may recall, um, one of our annual requirements is to notice the general public of our official uh, Water Board agenda posting place. Um, so what we've included in your packet is information about that, including a, um, an attached email from the city clerk's office with the city attorney's recommendation, uh, that being that your official notice uh, posting place will 
be at the city's website. And then we will additionally uh, post it at the service center there at 1100 South Sherman as a secondary posting place. So this is an action that the board needs to take to designate those as your official posting places. And then uh, lastly, included in the packet was uh, uh, some information on the Colorado Sunshine Law, just speaking to the um, requirement of noticing any meeting where there's meeting of the board. Okay. Thank you, Wes. Is there any questions? Go ahead, Kathy. I just have a question. I, I read through the opinion of the um, from the city clerk's office and legal opinion, and I'm certainly ready to make a motion to designate the city website as the official posting site. But then I thought in somewhere it said that the Civic Center was was the physical posting place, not the service center. It doesn't matter to me, but not very many people come to the. Yeah, so the there. so um, the email was the email that came from the city attorney's office went to all the board liaisons and some of those board liaisons um, don't have a. Um, a location such as ours. So each board is free to choose where their designated spot will be. Um, for consistency, the recommendation was to keep it on the city's website, but right. then additionally having a, a hard location, which is quite frankly easiest for us to use right there well, at the service center. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And then also one note of clarification, even though we would designate that as the service center as our um, secondary place, I also send up an agenda to the Civic Center and it does get posted on that board as well. Any further discussion? I don't see any. So it looks like we need a motion to make the city's website as the primary post or primary place for posting. Um, the notice for the meetings and then the service center is the secondary. Someone want to make that motion? So move. Kathy. All right. Kathy made the motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. Roger had the second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that motion carries four to nothing. Okay, so under we're on to um, agenda item nine, and nine A is the annual Button Rock Preserve and Forest Stewardship Update price. Great, looks like the screen share is working. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'll let. Uh, well, you all know that it is snowing up here at Button Rock. So if we get a couple billion more of these snowflakes, we'll be doing a little bit better going into the water year. Um, but I'm here to do a annual update on Button Rock Preserve and our forest stewardship efforts up here. Uh, I'll also give you a little bit of an intro to myself and the other full-time ranger up here if you want to go to the next slide, Heather. So unsurprisingly, when we look at the year, the big standout was COVID-19 and its impacts on our operations up here at Button Rock. Uh, as you may have heard, we've also had quite a fire season uh, and that had its own impact here on the preserve, both big and small fires. And I'll also talk about several ongoing and uh, completed projects at Button Rock. Next slide. Uh, before I get into that, I wanna give a quick intro to some new or nearly new faces. Um, some of you may have had the opportunity to meet Miles um, there's a picture of him. If you want to go back one, we've got some, yeah, there we go. So Miles Churchill, he is, uh, he's been hired as the full-time watershed ranger. He was a seasonal ranger with us at Button Rock since 2019. He knows the place, um, like the back of his hand, comes from a ranching background, has a lot of good applicable experience to work stewarding the preserve out here. And he has the, uh, title of being the Lone Ranger at Button Rock during 2020 and the summer of COVID and all of the challenges that he had to overcome. Uh, you want to click on the presentation there? And that's, that's Miles if you run into him up here. Um, he's uh, working under me and 
has a, a fair amount of, uh, he's got quite the work cut out for him. Click again. Who's the human? <laughs> yeah, Miles is on the right. Callie, oh no, actually, Callie's the dog on the right. She's kind of our mascot of Button Rock. And then Miles is there on the left. Uh, so again, my name is Price Hadley. I'm the senior watershed ranger. I work hand in hand with Miles and um, serve as his supervisor. This is my seventh year as a park ranger. I'm very excited to be starting work with the city of Longmont. I got hired in October. Um, prior to that, um, I was the ranger supervisor for Pickton County Open Space and Trails. Um, before that, I was living in this area, living, lived in Lyons, worked for City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks and different natural resource capacities and I have a master's of environmental management uh, from Western State and Gunnison. So very excited to get to apply that knowledge. And that's what I look like without a face mask on. Next slide. So as I alluded to, COVID-19 impacted Button Rock, just like it impacted the entire globe. Um, it interrupted a number of our projects um, that preceded my time with the city. Uh, our Boulder County Youth Corps season was unfortunately suspended. Uh, our volunteer efforts at the preserve were limited to one project, a, a weed pole. Uh, the management plan for the Button Rock Preserve was extended into 2021 due to the impacts of COVID-19 on our ability to do the public process and the meetings and whatnot. So that's gonna be extended into, uh, I believe, July. And along with COVID came a number of management challenges. If you wanna to go to the next slide. So the, the biggest, most obvious impact was increased visitation. Um, you know, we have the privilege in Colorado of having accessible public lands and even in a pandemic, you know, that, that's an outlet for us. Uh, and I'm definitely thankful for it, but it, that use had impacts on the preserve. We hosted 71,510 visitors in 2020, which was a 39% increase in hiking, a 55% increase in vehicle use. Uh, the impacts from that increased visitation included crowding, um, you know, impacts on the natural resource and kind of the recreational experience at Button Rock and quite a lot of demand on the Lone Ranger miles um, that was out here typically of a staffing level of um, three in summer seasons and miles was here uh, by himself, but I'll get a little bit more into how he dealt with that, but we saw a lot of use of our overflow parking lot and Miles issued over 140 warnings for illegal parking um, at the trailhead. Next slide. So in addition to uh, COVID, we dealt with a pretty severe fire season. Uh, I was hired right before the Calwood fire, so I was here for that uh, period of time, but um, during the summer season, we had three small fires. They're all suspected to be caused by lightning. Obviously, whenever we hear fire, we think of impacts to our watershed um, with sediment loss and water quality issues. We had one fire on the south shore and two along the main county and city road on the way into the preserve that rangers responded to, or a ranger responded to, miles responded to. Um, we had the Calwood fire that burned 10,106 acres, luckily not a single acre of Button Rock. However, it did burn within 1.3 miles of our preserve and Miles and I were paged out and were up here and watched the fire burn right past us on the other side of Coffin Top Mountain. We evacuated the visitors and closed the preserve from the 17th the day the fire ignited to November 4th when it was deemed safe again to allow visitors back into the preserve. And unfortunately, um, we're looking at another dangerous fire season in 2021. Next slide. So just a couple quick photos from the small fires. We have a lightning cause fire there on the south shore on the left photo. And on the right is a photo from a Forest Service crew that came out to do a helicopter mop up. Next slide. So the Calwood fire, as I said, we watched it burn right past us. If you look on the right there, that's the pyrocumulus cloud from the fire um, right on the other side of Highway 7, probably within four miles of where I'm standing in that photo when I took that photo. Um, we've got the smoke burning, you know, again there down to the south of us. That, photos, that photo on the left is from Button Rock Dam. So impacts to Button Rock itself. Um, luckily, we didn't have any burns. However, if you go to the next slide, 
uh, there were some, there were some severe burn areas um, and impacts to the South St. Vrain watershed. This is a photo from Central Gulch on Forest Service and maybe some Boulder County property. Uh, we did do a site visit in Central Gulch. Uh, we, we hiked up it from South St. Vrain, um, Ken Houston and I and uh, representatives from the Forest Service in Boulder County um, and a couple other agencies and um, Ken might have some more updates about that. But luckily, in terms of the North St. Vrain watershed, we were spared, but the South St. Vrain um, could see some sediment loading from that fire. And we're working with our partners to mitigate that to the best of our ability. Next slide. So COVID didn't stop everything. In fact, we are probably outnumbering visitors four to one right now with contractors. Um, the winter is our time to get projects done. Um, overall, we got some work done on forestry mitigation um, and we have a lot more planned. We've got, new, we've got multiple capital projects in the works as well as some small improvements aimed at uh, visitor safety. Next slide. So in terms of forestry, this year, 2020, we signed an MOU with Boulder County and the US Forest Service focused on cross-boundary uh, forest restoration and wildfire risk mitigation efforts. We continue to coordinate with the St. Vrain Healthy Forest Partnership uh, on those initiatives, as well as on the Calwood fire recovery and left-hand fire recovery efforts. We awarded a bid um, for a cut on the west side of Button Rock. It's 40 acres. It's it's being funded by an SFA grant in 2017. And there's more financial information uh, pertaining to the forestry uh, operations in the handout that's in your board, board packet. Uh, we've got a proposed cut, another 40 acres. We applied for a four-worm grant with Colorado State Forest Service, and we're hoping to um, get that funding. We'll know, I think, in February whether we have won that grant. Uh, and that was 40 acres would complement an additional 73 acres that are being cut on neighboring Boulder County open space uh, Hall Ranch. So kind of a, maybe not so much a landscape effort at wildfire risk reduction, but at least a watershed level um, risk reduction. So we're definitely hoping that that goes forward. Next slide. Um, so you see here in the, these are our forest management units at Button Rock. And there's a unit there that's circled in red, kind of red box on the center left of your screen. And that's the unit that's going to be uh, treated in, starting in March, 2021. The three units that are highlighted in yellow on the right side of your screen are the three that we've proposed to do a cut um, with Furworm grant funding if we're able to secure those funds. Next slide. We've got a lot of capital projects in the works, a lot of contractors busy out here. Uh, the biggest project being repairs to the Button Rock Dam outlet. Our regulatory gate uh, was in need of repairs due to some leaking. Um, we also did our annual outlet inspection when we depressurized the pipe to physically pull that gate out and have it machined and, and repaired. Uh, during that time, we've and diverting the water over the spillway as opposed to through the outlet pipe. Um, currently, we've got two large pumps operating on the spillway outside my office, um, basically diverting water, additional water over the spillway during the CBT closure. I can answer more questions about that later on. I'm sure Ken can also speak to that. In addition to those capital projects, we've been working on the renovation of one of the residences up here uh, that will serve as the secondary ranger residence that had numerous safety and health issues. So we've been looking at asbestos, installing a working heat system and addressing drinking water safety issues at both ranger residences up here uh, and repairing damage to the structure. Next slide. So there's our regulatory gate. I understand that it used to be about a 50 year um, occurrence for when you'd have to machine it and repair it. Uh, I believe that according to Jason Elkins that this could be a once in 100 year repair job with improved technology. Um, but it's pretty cool to see this piece of equipment installed in the 60s, um, seeing the light of day and get to uh, 
really get up close and see what that looks like. So those are the photos before it was machined and pressure washed and sandblasted and treated and it looks a lot better now and will look even better once it's all put back together hopefully in the next couple weeks. Next photo. So this is the second resonance that I was discussing. Obviously it's in need of some TLC. I got creative and took a photo through the hole in the wall from the inside to the outside of my Ranger truck there. So it's a work in progress, but it'll be a, a good investment going forward. And we've uh, definitely made a lot of progress over the last couple months. Next slide. And I think there's one more photo after that. So we've been, ha we had to take it down to the studs and we're improving it from there, fixing wiring issues and other problems as we go along. You can see the holes to the daylight there in the center of the photo. Next slide. Great, so we were also looking at visitor safety as rangers were always concerned about public safety and um, not only wanting to cultivate a positive experience out here for our visitors, but make sure that they're safe. Um, so as part of that, we've been updating our equipment, looking at how to better train our rangers. I installed two 911 call boxes um, and we've considered a third, but we have two installed, one at the ranger office and one at the base of the Button Rock Dam that are also available to staff. Um, so when we're doing water resource um, or maintenance activities, uh, contractors, engineers, uh, whomever can call out now from the exterior call box on the control house. I've also been coordinating with my counterparts at Boulder County to map um, unofficial trails, improve signage, and update our pamphlets and kiosk maps to uh, avoid um, searches for lost hikers up here. Next slide. So if you see these signs around, if you do get the chance to come visit Button Rock, they'll be directing you to the to a place where you can call 911, which is great since we don't have cell connection up here and we have pretty spotty radio connection. And I've, I went and looked back at past annual reports and it seems like my predecessors have always had a critters slide. So I thought I'd put that in there. Um, just a couple photos that I've taken in my first couple months up here. It's a beautiful wild place. I'm, very lucky to be uh, tasked with protecting it. We've got a mule deer buck there on the left in Mullen Park and Button Rock Preserve and a black red fox on the west side in the Barrow area on the west shore of Ralph Price Reservoir. Next slide. I'm happy to take any questions about our Button Rock Preserve operations or the Ranger program or anything else. Thanks, Price. Any questions for Price on the presentation? I, I did have a couple of, I guess, one observation and one question. Uh, on the price, you mentioned the number, the increase in visitors up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, has that been a major, I mean, what kind of problems have you gotten in terms of that big of increase in the visitation? And I guess, you know, I know Rocky Mountain National Park has done more of a reservation system mm -hmm. to try to manage that. I don't know if, if that's warranted in this case, but just kind of curious what you guys have seen and what problems that's resulted in. Yeah, I think, I mean, with a lot of public lands, often the most visible impact of increased visitation or capacity issues is parking congestion, parking issues. Um, the city took a number of steps this summer to address that. We posted temporary no parking signs along County Road 80 on the way into Button Rock um, to make sure that we were maintaining a proper flow of traffic if we needed to get emergency vehicles in. We worked with other working groups within Public Works and Natural Resources to bring additional staff to supplement the one ranger that was on duty during the summer and also worked with Longmont uh, Police Department to have police officers out here just as kind of a presence. Um, I think the, the most obvious example is that, again, that parking issue. We have an overflow parking area um, 0.9 miles from the trailhead that sees use um, in, even in um, January on, on busy weekend days, especially around the holiday. Um, so, you know, I, honestly, having come from a, a bigger and busier public land system in Pickens County, where I'm used to about 10 times the number of visitors, closer to 700,000, um, I, I think that there's a lot of similar challenges here, but I think we've got some good tools to address it and, um, 
you know, prevent us from needing to go to a reservation system. I think that um, we're lucky that we have a gate and um, we have kind of a self-regulating system with limited parking. Um, people are motivated enough they could hike in from Boulder County open space to the Forest Service land. Um, but like that, along with just making sure that we've got adequate staffing up here for resource protection and water resource management needs um, should really help us to be prepared. And there's a little bit more information about kind of steps we took in that handout if you want to look at that as well. Thanks, Price. The only other thing that struck me is just in terms of the funding for the last 10 years on the um, stewardship program, you know, there's been $951,000 spent, 445000 of which is from grants. Mm -hmm. I, I just think, you know, the leverage that the city has kind of done in terms of you know, doing forest stewardship, but trying to use grants to, to help in the funding is pretty dramatic. So that really kind of struck me. So it, I think the only other thing going through my mind is obviously with the other fires around, anything we can do proactively and, and especially using grants, hopefully will reduce the potential or the severity of the fires if, if it comes into the Button Rock Preserve. So I just think you guys have done a, a great job. Um, you know, you're predecessor price and hopefully you kind of going forward in terms of managing that the preserve and um, doing the the stewardship so anyway that just struck me any other comments or um, questions for price on the, the presentation um, Allison yeah thank you so much first of all um, really great pictures uh, thank you so much for sharing those those are beautiful even the unfortunate ones of the fire um, and I also just wanted to commend you. I uh, have been up there recently with my family and it's a really great experience. And I, I did see the ranger, the Lone Ranger and all together was just a great place to be. So thank you very much for all you're doing. Um, one question is how do you staff over the weekend? Cause it was pretty, pretty busy there. And with two of you, is that somewhat challenging? How do we, um, do you say that one more time? How do we what over the weekend? How do you do the staffing over the weekend? Oh, um, so Miles and I, uh, we work 10 hour days. We split the week. Uh, we kind of vary our schedule uh, really at this point um, with daylight hours um, since we, we don't quite have 10 hours of daylight. So we kind of match it to those hours. Um, we try to be out during the busiest times, cover as much of the 3,000 acres of the preserve as we can um, with you know, pretty frequent, frequent stops back to the front side to kind of assess the parking situation. Um, and uh, we look forward to having an additional temporary ranger coming on board in, um, it looks like in March, who will train. Um, so that's gonna be really helpful. Um, you know, I'm able to piggyback on a lot of what, a lot of the good stuff that Daniel Levine and Miles and Ken and other people have done up here. Um, got some ideas for how to better manage the flow of traffic and whatnot using pop-up signs and things like that uh, in summer 2021. So I think we've got a, a fighting chance at least. Thank you though, Alice. I'm glad you had a good time up here. Thanks, Alice and Kathy. Um, I just, I don't know if I missed it somewhere along the line, but last year we talked about dogs, the issue with dogs on, uh, and I wondered if, has that been resolved or are there problems with people bringing giant amounts to dogs or uh, I mean, Specifically speaking to the, you know, so currently we require dogs be unleashed at all times. And then we require uh, people <laughs> only bring one dog per visitor. Um, and I would say shockingly based on my prior six years of, of rangering experience and maybe a community of less compliance, but um, that the compliance with the, especially the one dog per visitor rule is pretty fantastic. Oh, that's um, good. I haven't seen any dog walkers and in the past that was an issue and you'd have someone with eight dogs and you, there's no way you could possibly clean up after them and then that has some water quality impacts. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's once a week that we encounter somebody with more than one dog per visitor. Um, you know, we probably talk to people almost every day with dogs off leash, but there are a lot of people out here with dogs. So overall the compliance is um, definitely the majority. So I'd say based on my previous experience working on other public land systems as a ranger, that compliance is pretty good. Um, and it helps that we have one gate where we can 
uh, present people with all the signs and make sure that they're educated and they they do understand what the rules are when they come in. Um, we have them posted in you know, both Spanish and English. So um, people have every opportunity to be educated on it before they come through the, the gate. All right, good news. Yeah, and Kathy, other... if I could- Go ahead, Ken. Just add a little bit to that. Um, what we did a year and a half ago when we recommended to council to change that to one dog uh, on a leash, um, this has really been a, a year and a half, will be about two years um, next summer when we've been trying it, this um, method. And we certainly hope this is working well that um, part of the overall Button Rock Preserve uh, management plan will be to address that very question, decide if this is working or we, you know, need to go loosen it a little or go to no dogs at all. All of those will be explored as part of the conversation. And you'll really start seeing that conversation in um, this coming spring, I hope, uh, late spring as we bring forward that final master plan. And that will be when that final decision will be made when we bring forward that management plan for both water board and city council's consideration. So we'll have one more. One more look at that uh, in-depth look. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Roger, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, just curious, the spillway restoration, What uh, what is the estimated completion date on that being finished up? Anybody's on the restoration guess on that? The outlet? Yeah, yes. I believe that we're looking at the first week of March. Ken, does that still sound accurate to you? Yeah, that's, we, we actually, they've just finished the internal outlet um, work, uh, repairing some of the coal tar lining, epoxy coating everything. The gate is still down in Denver being um, refaced, but should be coming back maybe even this week. Um, and then we hope uh, the first week of February start reassembling. And uh, end of February, early March, mid is, is when it should be completely back and fully functional. Okay, one, one question, you. one question, Ken, you, you know, Price mentioned you guys are pumping out of the reservoir um, in relation to the um, Southern Spy Pipeline outlet or outage, I should say. Um, will you need to continue to do that or are you going to let the reservoir fill up and then start spilling again um, coming up um, once the the, out, the Southern Spy Pipeline work is done? Um, good, great question, Todd. Um, so during this outage of our outlet at Button Rock, we've been taking most of our water from the uh, car, CBT system through the Carter Lake Connecting Pipeline that has a pipeline up to Carter Lake. It is going down for uh, an annual inspection starting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock and it's scheduled to come back Wednesday at about four or five o'clock. So we'll have about a day and a half where that pipeline's down. As a result, um, you know, we needed to get water to the water treatment plant for tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, we've um, installed two large capacity pumps at our spillway. Um, Prior to today, um, the, the reservoir was full and was spilling um, over the spillway, um, but that was just fluctuating with the natural flow of the North St. Rain Creek, which was nowhere near sufficient to supply our water demand. Um, those two pumps right now, um, they can each do uh, 4,000 gallons a minute. Um, we're, we've got them running right now. We just turned them on today at 3,500 gallons a minute each, and that's a lot of water. <laughs> um, we will be pulling down the reservoir uh, about a foot and a half to two feet um, over the next day and a half. Uh, so it'll no longer be spilling. Um, at that point, the um, CBT pipeline should be back on. We will turn off one of those two pumps and then we'll keep the other pump running, but we'll throttle it down to, to almost um, 
just basically barely idling uh, so that we're still pumping a little bit of water over the spillway, kind of keep the, the creek flowing, but it, it won't be anywhere near enough to run down to our water treatment plant. Um, and we estimate it'll take about three days for every day we pump, uh, three days to recover for every day we pump. So about four or five to six days, um, we should get the, the back close to having the spillway full. And at that point, we'll just let it go over the spillway for the remainder of February. So, you, you know, we can't completely shut off the river <laughs> for four or five days, but um, we'll keep those pumps running. We have, them, we have them leased for an additional week on past the end of this current week. So that should be sufficient to get, uh, allow the reservoir to recover. Thank you, Ken. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any. Thank you for the presentation, Price. That was very helpful. Thank you, Ted. All right, next item is 9B, which is the monthly water supply update, Wes. Yeah, so um, I'll go through that uh, with the board. Um, you're welcome to kind of follow along with me in, in your packet. Um, so I'm gonna be starting by um, looking at page 19 in the packet. Um, just gonna go through some of those water supply and, and drought indicator bullets. Um, as I've mentioned before, Lama continues to remain at a sustainable water conservation level. Um, we'll be revisiting that level with council, water board and council uh, this summer, or late spring, early summer, once we get our complete snowpack. Um, the recent flows uh, at St. Vrain and Button Rock, Ken just spoke a little bit to that. We have uh, slightly more increased releases from Button Rock, but the majority of that water is being picked up at our north pipeline going to the water treatment plant. So the effect on the river is still negligible. Um, we're, as Nelson reported earlier today, um, the flows at Lyons were around 8 CFS with an historic average of 14. So um, given, depending upon the day, uh, we're somewhere in that third, around the third of the historic average, um, which lends itself to how dry it is. Um, local St. Vrain Creek storage um, is below average. We're, um, we're at around 62% as the end of last month. And normally we're around 70%. The good news related to that though is we're full higher up in the system. That is Button Rock is full where it would have otherwise been down and Union Reservoir and Pleasant Valley, which would normally be fuller are down. So we still have, um, even though we are down uh, more in total storage, um, we've got it in a place that we're happy to have it. Um, again, as Union, as Nelson mentioned, Union is down about uh, 2,500 acre feet below the historic average. So normally we'd been down about 2,500 acre feet, but we're down about 5,000 acre feet. Um, our water treatment demands last year were about 104% of 2002 numbers. And the reason we referenced 2002, that was kind of one, a start of a drought year. And when we were, and what's interesting is our population has obviously increased since 2002. So in the last 19 years, our population has went up, but yet we're only using about 4% more. So if you looked at it on the short term, compared to last year or the year prior, sorry, We've used about 2,000 acre feet more, but we've still used a similar amount to what we used in 2008. So in other words, with all that being said, um, the citizens have been doing a great job of conserving their water. They're using what we have expected. Um, and um, we wanna to continue to encourage them to do that. Um, the Colorado Snowtail data, uh, which Nelson kind of shared some of those numbers with you, our South Platte River Basin is at 77% of normal with Colorado River Basin at 70% of normal. 
Not a significant change from last month when we reported. Um, I didn't really expect there to be a significant change where we're really going to start to see that here is in the next month or two. That's when we get those wet snows that contribute to the higher moisture content in that snow. Pleasant Valley Reservoir um, was a call for quite a while. It, um, it put uh, some water in its reservoir and we took some water of Pleasant Valley Decree into the treatment plant. So it was good that we had that water right available to use in the water treatment plant. Where that ended up was that Pleasant Valley Reservoir sits now at about 42% of full. Um, so we've got about 1800 acre feet left to, uh, to fill Pleasant Valley. So it'll either take its own decree to its own uh, decree, its enlargement decree to come in, or Longmont has some uh, other water rights that have been um, adjudicated to be stored in there, our high mountain dams, or we could even choose to put CBT. So we'll see how the rest of the runoff season comes, but we're thinking we're definitely going to get some more water of some sort in Pleasant Valley Reservoir. Um, again, up there at Button Rock, you guys have kind of uh, touched on that a little bit. We're hopeful that we will be ready to have that outlet fully functional uh, by the first part of, of March. Um, we, the, the staff has did an exceptional job, I believe, in my opinion, to make sure that even during this outage, that should something unforeseeable happen, there will still be water be able to be provided to the water treatment plants and serve the citizens. So, um, I appreciate everybody's effort because it's taken a lot of, of uh, energy and resources to make that happen. Um, moving on to the next page. Um, if Pleasant Valley Reservoir doesn't fill, um, there, there potentially is some impacts to the rough and ready ditch system in particular, Yew Creek Golf Course, Fox Hill Golf Course, Stephen Day Parks, things like that. But it's probably premature to um, um, expect there to be significant impacts on those, but we're aware that that might happen and, and we're preparing accordingly. The current CBT system is relatively full for this time of year. Uh, Longmont, with a 50% quota issued by Northern on November 1st, um, adding to that our carryover that we plan to declare um, uh, here within the month, um, along with our Excel agreement, we should have um, more than sufficient CBT uh, resources to get us through this next year. Um, as always, we have to wait till Northern Board sets its next quota. That happens usually in, uh, I believe it's in April and March or April. Um, we have what's a 50% quota right now. They could issue um, an up to an additional 50 for a total of 100%. Um, and they'll take a lot of things into consideration in making that determination. But as of right now, we're fairly feeling that we're very uh, solid with the trans basin supplies that we have available for us. Um, again, it's been mentioned several times, but it's worth overemphasizing. We've got extremely dry soil moisture. Um, and so it's going to take an above average snowpack to yield an average runoff. So we'll have to continue to monitor that. I've included some other additional um, attachments. Um, and I'm going to go from my notes because I had it pulled up and, and I... Um, Wes, do you want me to share any of those? Yeah, pages? if you would, that would, be, that would be great, Heather. We could jump okay. to page 21, if you wouldn't mind just kind of showing those and then I can speak to those as you roll through them. Okay. So there you go. Thank you. So um, on this one, we're going to continue to provide you, uh, you all with water supply and drought indicators. Um, what this is showing, we're, we're kind of updating these twice a month, the first of the month and the middle of the month. Um, not really expecting any real significant changes to these, but more of trends. Um, on the very bottom, there's a runoff forecast and that information really started coming, information started coming to us this month. 
And so it's early in that runoff forecast model. It's saying that we're you know, around 80%, give or take, for our basin. And um, next time we come to waterboard, hopefully we'll be at least that or maybe, maybe even better. Uh, next page, Heather. So this is a copy of the end of mother end of month <laughs> reservoir storage. Again, I mentioned earlier we we're at 61, around 61 and a half percent. And it kind of shows you how Button Rock's nearly full or at full at 100 percent. And some of those other reservoirs are down. As always, Highland is a significant part of that uh, contribution. They're kind of there in the middle. And um, uh, so it takes a while for their system to fill. The advantage Longlot has with some of its reservoirs is we we have the ability to put more than just the, that reservoir decree into our reservoirs. So it gives us, if you will, more more water at times available to to, to fill fill them up, like Pleasant Valley and Union, as well as Button Rock. So still filling pretty good, even though it's below average. Uh, next slide, please. So starting in January, they. Um, Colorado Water Supply Outlook comes out. I've included on this month kind of a statewide is what you'll be hearing in the media and in the news is oftentimes a statewide. And sometimes statewide reflects what we hear here, we're seeing here in our basin, sometimes not so much. As of right now, the Colorado statewide water supply conditions are very similar to the um, St. Vrain Basin. And so, um, I'm going to, I'll be including that, but what you'll see in this, uh, in the graph here is that we're better than we were in the water year 2018, which is that green line. And we're not quite as good as the average. So we're kind of in the middle, but again, I guess a, an important part of this is you see that that's falling at around five to six inches of snow water equivalent. We're normally at the, towards sometime in April, we're, pushing around 15 uh, inches. And so we're only about a third of the way there. So we don't need to panic. We just need to, as Nelson said, do our snow dances. All right, next, next page, please. So this is just another um, uh, graph kind of showing some of those different basins and how they shape up. So you, you can kind of see down in the lower left in that uh, south uh, west corner, it's a little drier down there. Um, whereas in the upper Rio Grande in that blue area, they're closer to average, but generally speaking, we're just slightly below average. All right, next slide, please. So this is our Colorado monthly pre uh, precipitation. And what we find here in this graph is generally drier up in most of Colorado relative to the all of Colorado, it's been a little little bit wetter in the Arkansas and the upper Rio Grande. And so time will tell, hopefully we can push uh, above average in our precipitation for Colorado here uh, later on in the in the water year. Next, next page, please. This this particular chart shows the Colorado uh, reservoir storage and what you the, the thing to note on these is they're all very similar to what we've seen in prior years. So no, no one particular basin is, has a significant change, either increase or decrease in its, in its storage. And so that's, that we might say is good news. Next page. So the Colorado stream flow forecasts, um, those come from a number of different sites. Um, for our site, the South Platte, which one, and the upper Colorado that we're paying attention to, they take a number of different specific locations to come up with their stream flow forecast. Ours is in that 70 to 89% of average as of January 1st, where the, uh, the upper Colorado was just right, right in there, maybe slightly, slightly lower. Next sheet. So on the next several pages here, what we're gonna, what you're gonna see is just some more detailed information. I won't go through each of these pages. They're just kind of give you some more description of what's going on there. I think we'll, when it becomes really important for us to pay attention to the Colorado ba River Basin, because that ties into our CBT supplies and the South Platte River Basin, 
will be more in your April and May time frame. So those are when we're getting a more complete picture. So we're going to go ahead and if you want to jump on up to page 32 for me, Heather. So the way that the um, uh, that they present this information, they, it's kind of, it looks a little interesting to, to try to follow. What There's a line at about 100% on the far right, and that is showing how much um, flow we would have if we've seen 100% um, normal runoff. What the, what the green is, is what, where they think is most likely to occur. So you have a kind of a 50-50% chance of occurring. And so when you see this line, this kind of this uh, line on the right-hand side, what that's telling you is there's a greater chance that we're going to be drier than, it's, than it is that we're going to be wetter. And so we kind of just kind of look at these as a general barometer to see where we're going to, where we'll kind of fall out at. And if we jump to, I think it's uh, Heather, if we go to page 36, I think it is. Uh, let's go one more, please, to 37. Uh, right there. So St. Vrain Creek at Lyons. They kind of give you two different forecast periods, April through June and April through September. And so what this is saying essentially is that we have an equal chance of, of seeing um, 66,000 acre feet of water flowing through Lyons in April or June. We have an equal chance of seeing 76,000 acre feet of water flowing through Lyons on April through September, where normally we would expect to see 88,000 acre feet or 103,000 acre feet respectively. So, um, that's a, that's a lot of information, but it just basically says right now they're planning that it's going to be drier than it is normal. And that's not, that's not surprising given our, our conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So we always like to include these, uh, the USDA's snowpack summaries. They're a real good visual of where we're at, similar to that one we looked at before. Um, we're not as low as we've historically been, nor are we as high, but again, emphasis is we were at, we've now at five inches of snow water equivalent where our peak is normally at 15. So we're only a third of the way there. And so the next few months will kind of be a telltale of what this year's uh, gonna look like. Next slide. Same thing on the upper Colorado, maybe slightly grimmer than it was on the uh, South Platte, but again, it is early, so we'll have to wait. And it really emphasis added how much these spring storms can uh, change those, uh, snow, those snow water runoff predictions. Uh, next page, please. And then lastly, we have, this is one specific for St. Vrain. Um, it kind of, those little bandwidths give you the um, it's kind of the confidence level that they have that, um, that we're going to see certain runoff. And so where we would like to see it obviously is higher. Um, right now it's showing about a little over two inches of snow water equivalent, um, where normally, um, you know, we would be somewhat higher. I think in certain years we've had, you know, four to four to six, even eight inches of snow water equivalent. But again, these graphs all start to look very similar to one another. And that is, we're not terrible, not great, but we're not bad. And we're just gonna keep hoping for hopefully some good wet snows. And I think that's, I think that's all I have for that. And I'd be happy to answer some questions if you have them. Thanks Wes, any questions? Not seeing any, one question Wes I had is if, if we're 5,000 acre foot down on Union, what what bearing or what does that have any implications with regards to the ability of Longmont to meet the Piesco trade? Um, I think you're using wholly consumable effluent and then you supplement with Union. Is that right? And if that is right, and we're that far that much lower than kind of average, we're 25 
hundred acre foot below average or typical for this time of year? Does that create any concerns or worries about meeting that obligation this year? So um, a lot of what Piesco agreement has to do with is it's about timing. So they'll tell us when it is that they need water. Um, so, and that varies based on a number of conditions that they evaluate. Um, one of the strategies that we're exploring is unions, union is off channel. So it has to be filled via the oligarchy ditch and it takes a while to fill. And so one of the things that we're considering is taking um, maybe earlier in the spring, releasing some fully consumable water out of Button Rock and over a longer period of time, deliver it to Union through the oligarchy. So it can have a chance to fully fill uh, before the runoff season is over. It, what that does is it creates a space in Button Rock to fill, which is on channel. Because it's on channel many times in a single day, we have more water rights available to us than we can quote unquote use. But being if it's on channel, we can utilize those decrees and, and get those stored. So we think there's some operational things that we can consider to allow us to uh, manage our water resources in such a way that it's less of a concern. Um, right now, I don't think we have any, any real concern about meeting uh, that trade agreement because we could always release water out of Button Rock and send it on through the St. Vrain. Um, we just have to work uh, very closely with the state engineer's office to make that happen. So Wes, the reason you'd use the um, releases out of Button Rock through the oligarchy is because later in the season, they're delivering their own water and there's not capacity in the ditch to get it there. Is that why? Well, actually, it's, it's, it's a, a function of we don't know how long Union may come into priority under its own decree. And if, for example, it came under into priority under its own decree for 30 days, um, 30 days would not be long enough to be able to fill it. And so what we're, what we're wanting to do is to create a situation where we can leverage the time, i.e. early before runoff, and take a longer period of time to start slowly filling union so that when it does come into priority, we can finish filling it. And yet at the very tail end of the runoff season, when we still have a lot of water rights available to us that can go into storage, we can put those into button rock because it's on channel. And one other point I'd like to point out, Todd, is that um, in a typical year, um, we're gonna have three to 4,000 acre foot hole in button rock and that's three to 4,000 acre foot hole in Union for a total of about, you know, six to 8,000 acre foot hole. This year, even though Union's down more than normal, 5,000 acre foot down, Button Rocks is zero. So the actual hole we have left to fill this year is actually a little bit smaller than in a typical year. And that's, right. that's primarily a fun, it's partially a function of, of course, we couldn't get any water out of Button Rock, but also um, because of, of the situation we've had with Button Rock and Union going down, we've actually collateralized a, a lot of uh, more CB, CBT water into Windy Gap water this year. So we had higher um, effluent return flow credits. And so that helped us keep from re releasing even more water out of Union. So the actual hole is, sounds big because it's the one spot but it's not too bad. Good point, thank you, Ken. Any other questions, comments on the water supply update? If, Great, if thank I, you, Wes. Oh, if go I ahead. could just point out one thing, um, uh, you look around the horn on all of these snow tail sites and it, it is a little bit scary this year. <laughs> um, there is one though that I would like to point out and that is the Berthid Pass snow tail is sitting at 90% um, with this week, this couple days of storms coming through. It's even gonna get closer to, you know, it, it's just gonna be barely below 100% at the Berthoud Pass. That's the Fraser River Basin. Um, and actually, if you look at 
look at some of the photos from Winter Park all the way to Bertha Pass. It looks it looks really good on the snowpack there. That's our Fraser River um, basin, which is our Windy Gap water supply. And so one of the advantages of having a really diverse portfolio, both Windy Gap, CBT, and Native Basin, is that one of those three basins might do better in a, in a year in this this year, it happens to be Windy Gap that's uh, paying off for us. Um, obviously, we're only a third of the way through the snowpack season and a long ways to go, but um, it looks like we should be able to pump some Windy Gap water this year to meet, meet all of our um, deliveries we've already taken. And so that, that's gonna be very beneficial to us. Um, Windy Gap's paying off this year. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Any other questions, comments? Okay, we'll keep moving on. Um, item 9C is the monthly legislative report, Ken. Sorry about that. I don't have a whole lot to report on the legislative report. Um, the legislature met um, on January 15th um, just to seat and formally um, start the legislature. And then they immediately went into uh, recess. <laughs> um, they have recessed until um, I believe it's February 16th. Um, and, and that I'm sure is a kind of a if, we'll see how, how the, um, everything's going with COVID at that point. But um, they're, they're recessed because of, of the COVID issues. Um, so they, there's only been one um, on that one day, they, the only water bill they introduced that day was the annual uh, joint resolution on the water projects authorization. So that's all the about 100 projects that's funded through the Colorado Water Conservation Board. We see that every year. Uh, I don't believe Longmont doesn't have a project on it this year, but um, we usually support it just because um, it helps so many water utilities. Um, although that really rarely has any problem moving forward. So there really isn't any legislation yet to talk about, but uh, they'll be back in session on the 15th, which is about, which might even be, I believe our February, no, it'll be a week before our February board meeting, but um, we'll, we'll have a little bit more to report in February. <laughs> so that's it on that, thank you. Okay, right. thanks Ken. Next item is 9D, which is the Water Resources Engineering Projects Update. And if I understand right, Jason's up at Button Rock. Ken, are you going to handle that? Yeah, I'll, I'll handle that for him. Um, actually, you kind of stole the thunder on this one, and we were going to talk about the, the outlet repair. <laughs> and I think we've probably covered that as well as the pumping and um, where we're going there. So the only other uh, major project we got going on right now is um, the pre the planning and the engineering for a pump station we plan on putting in the town alliance to pump water from our south st brain pipeline to our north st brain pipeline that recently went to city council to approve an iga with the uh, town of lions um, for uh, acquisition of the right of way for that installation both uh, city council as well as the town alliance uh, board also approved that agreement so we've we've got the uh uh, IGA foundation ready to go for that agreement. We've uh, just working on acquiring uh, the, uh, uh, it's gonna be a design build uh, installation. So just working on that and should be moving that fo project forward here pretty quickly. And so that's really all I have right now on projects. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any questions from the board? All right, I don't see any. Um, so we'll keep moving on. The next item is 10 items from the board. And the first item is review of water board bylaws and guiding water principles. And the memo looks like it's actually from me. <laughs> but what, what I wanted to maybe give a little background, Ken contacted me and said there were some items in there that we should maybe um, discuss as a board. Um, so those are listed. I think there's five of them. Um, Ken, do you want to just maybe walk us through those items and then, you know, we can discuss that as a board? Yeah, I'll bounce, bounce that off you real quick here. Um, the uh, first item 
is the wording reference in the bylaws to chairman and vice chairman. That was actually reviewed about 10 or 15 years ago by the board who chose at that time to, to leave it. That is the actual proper terminology, but um, many boards choose to use the word either chair, chairperson or just chair, uh, you know, um, that's really a more of a style. The, the actual legal way you do it is you say, Madam Chairman or Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, but uh, that, that does tend to get changed in, in some, some uh, bylaws. Um, as far as the other boards in the city, it, there is no uniform standard about about a third of them in the de de department use chairman and about a third use chair and the uh, other third use chairperson. So I, th I think, it, you know, it, I just wanted to highlight that um, in case there was an interest in looking at that uh, issue. Uh, the next one was absenteeism. Um, we, we really never, um, the water board ch changed the language to what you see today, uh, again, about 10 years ago. Um, we really didn't get too tight on, on what is an excused versus an unexcused used absence. Um, the, the practicing policy so far has been, as long as you call in, you know, it's an excused absence. Um, if you just don't show up, it's unexcused. And we're, staff is fine with that, but um, we wanted to make sure you know, sometimes that can make it hard to, um, we've, we've never had a problem with, with uh, uh, board, enough board members attending to have a quorum, but um, wanted to highlight that. Um, the third one is the public broadcast of the monthly meetings. Um, uh, we've really in the past have never had a live broadcast, although these Zoom meetings if, if everybody, you know, <laughs> probably getting tired of them, but they, they actually do work. Um, so uh, we thought we may, the board may want to consider thinking around that issue, partially for the ability, um, whether or not a board member who's traveling out of state or not available, you know, could maybe attend um, remotely like that. Um, it does sound like, you know, Heather did explain that the Longmont leader will now uh, probably resume once we go at, back to live meetings, we'll probably resume. So that may be fine. We may leave it at that or maybe we may, um, we've never had a policy where you can attend remotely. Um, uh, so that's really kind of both the public broadcast, the next two bullet points. Uh, so the board may want to consider doing that or may not, um, you know. And then finally is the timing on the water board packet. Um, currently, it's kind of hardwired in there uh, five days, and I have to admit, we try to meet that five day, but we don't always meet it. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of, couple of points you could think about. We're fine if we leave it at five days, and we'll do our best to get you that packet exactly five days before the meeting. Um, you could, um, some board members kind of prefer it even earlier because they don't want to have to spend their whole weekend. I, I, you know, it's like city council. I can't imagine how they get their packets and <laughs> huge 500 page packets. And they, they, uh, I feel sorry for them, but uh, at least this is just once a month instead of every week. But after uh, the first year you stop reading hanger leases, that's how we do it. I, I can see that on the hanger leases. I, I got you. I, I agree with you. Um, so, so, you know, one thought is, you know, it'd be better for the board if you went earlier, but the, if, if, if we got it, if we had to get it to the board earlier, that works its way back to, we, we have to have the information earlier to put the packet together earlier. And then you have um, the applicants then have, have to come in earlier and it makes people actually miss a water board meeting because they couldn't get their information to us in time for us to process it and get it in the packet. Or you could do it later. Um, now that we're doing it electronically, it's real easy for us to you know, hit, hit send and we can hit send on Friday and that's you know, two business days, four, four calendar days. So it, it could be moved if, if 
that kind of timing is no problem. It would give people who are trying to get on the board and trying to get information to us an extra day or two. So um, I'm not advocating for either one, either way or either direction. I just wanted to highlight that. That's currently what it says is five days and we do try to meet that and we apologize if we don't meet it every time. Yeah. So those are kind of some areas. Don't need any of those changes. Um, we'd be perfectly fine if you wish to, um, you know, uh, uh, adopt, approve the uh, uh, bylaws as is, but just were a couple things that we kind of thought about over, over the last year and thought you might want to consider. Kathy, go ahead. Uh, so just a few comments. Um, as far as what you call the chairperson, uh, unless the men are happy to be called Mr. Chairwoman, then I would say that we should change it to chair. I just think the whole person thing is too awkward in the mouth. Um, and then I like when we get the packets. It gives me plenty of time and, you know, that could even be a day less, but um, that's where I fall on those two issues. Okay, is there other, Roger, go ahead. Uh, back to the chair thing. <laughs> I mean, if everybody gets, anybody gets, you know, really upset about the way it is, I would be fine with chairperson or vice chairperson. I'm just gonna give you my, I'm not gonna go with chairwoman, I don't think, Kathy, but <laughs> chairperson would be fine with me. But secondly, on the packets, you know, some, I used to go on to the, uh, website of city council or I mean Longmont advisory boards and you can you can scroll in there and they got a place where they show the meeting time and show the packets and what have you I've noticed for several months that is not being uh, utilized for some reason it used to be populated and uh, when you open it up now there's uh, you know there's nothing there and I was just kind of curious why that changed or if anybody else noticed that. Heather or Marcia, Marcia, why don't you start? Um, they have changed the document management system. And so the packets are still accessible. Um, and so what you're probably looking at is an un, is a link that hasn't been updated. Unfortunately, since I use the internal one, I don't know what it is but I will be happy to um, uh, contact the right person. I'll take that as an action item. And could you um, please email me the link that isn't there anymore or the, the, the spot where there's nothing there anymore? Well, it's, it's not so much there's nothing there, but it, you go to the water board and the space where it says agenda, and pack it, it's just, it's just not, it's just not, and there's nothing there. And, and the yeah, meeting that's... date is not, so you don't even see a meeting date anymore. Okay, so this is that, so I, where but, all of the boards are along the, li the, the left side of the page, that page, that place? Correct. Okay. Yes. So I can help clarify that a little bit if I um, can jump in. Um, so as Council Member Martin said, in July of last year, we started using a different document uh, management system and to streamline where all of the community members are pointed to, to make things a little bit more transparent for people. We have um, taken all of the agendas and stuff from the various boards and put it into one place on one page. So I'll share my screen real quick and I'll show you how to get there from the city's home page. So this is the um, longmontcolorado.gov. And if you hover over the departments tab along the top, over on the left-hand side, you'll see where it says agendas and minutes. And right underneath that says agenda management portal. If you click on that, it will take you to the page where every um, council meeting and every advisory board meeting is listed. And you just scroll down and you'll see the place where all of those are listed. Here are the current ones. You'll see the water board here. And then there's also an agenda that you can download. And if you click on this three um, dots here, you can download the full packet there as well. Oh, okay. All right. But that, um, 
that kind of made it easier for all of the community members to find everything in one place. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, Heather, I don't. Are you sending? You're sending out that link, right? Because I during the meeting I went and clicked on that. I got. I pulled up the agenda while we were all talking, and I. You see me looking away. I'm looking over at my other computer. Um, at the agenda, but I didn't know those dots bring up the packet. So thank you. Yeah. And then also um, as a note on the waterboard page, there's also a link to take you to that portal. So if you get to the waterboard page, oh, okay. you'll see a listing of this year's meeting dates, but the portal, there's a link on there to get you to the portal for the agendas and the um, packet. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I guess what's striking me is um, maybe on the, I'm, I'm fine with uh, just going with chairs to Kathy's suggestion. Um, it seems like that kind of simplifies, simplifies things. And we, you know, if we won't have to deal with it, hopefully in the future, um, maybe what we need, if we're going to go that route is a, a motion. Do we need a motion can to go ahead and do that? And then we change that in the bylaws. Is that right? Okay, let's see if there's anything else. In terms of the absenteeism, you know, it seems like it's been working fine to date, um, you know, in terms of the, you know, as long as people are letting us know and we're not having people just not showing for multiple meetings at a time, I guess if we get to that point, we could address it at, at that time in my mind. The public broadcast and talking to Heather before the meeting, it sounds like the Longmont Observer, the Longmont Leader now is, is actually in a contract with the city to provide kind of live streaming if and when we ever can get back together. Marcia, it looks like you have a, maybe an update or comment on that. Um, just that it's not the Longmont Leader, which is now a private business. Um, it's, uh, it's Longmont Public Media is under contract. I guess the bottom line is we've got another entity that would be live streaming that for us. Um, it, it, so, um, when we get back together, hopefully <laughs> sooner than later, um, you know, it sounds like that'll, the city kind of as a whole is handling it through that, the public media outlet. So that's fine. I think we can maybe just hold off on, on that. They'll be recording it. Um, the remote attendance at meetings, um, in that, uh, um, I think it's good to have that that capability um, in the future, but I think we maybe hold off on that now until we can get back together and see, you know, where we end up with as far as, you know, kind of future recording and you know, maybe that's a, a year from now we just revisit that item. I don't know if we need to act on that now. And timing on the board packets, I'm fine with the four days if that gives us the Friday um, you know, so they have an extra day, Ken. Um, I don't know if any other board members have a thought on that, but I think we typically get it on a Friday, which works for me. Um, I can review it over the weekend or on Monday before the meeting itself. So, um, And, and we would, would say, still try to get it out sooner. Than that's that. fine. We just okay. didn't want it to be a hard deadline. And <laughs> That's fine. Um, do we need a, if, if we go that route, do we need a motion on that then to change it to, I don't know, at least four days prior? What do you recommend there? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend you just make one motion to amend the bylaws and then approve them for, for those two items. Okay. Th those are my thoughts, but um, any other comments or is everybody okay with, with those two items? All right. If we are, we need a, a motion for, I guess, the changing the bylaws to, to have chair instead of chairman. And then the timing of the board packets um, at least four days prior to the board meeting. I so move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Motion by Allison. Second. We have a second by second. Roger. Any further discussion? I don't see any. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries four to zero. The, the other item I guess we need to talk about kind of separately is we have the guiding um, uh, water policies, the statement of goal and the policy statement. Um, was there any questions, comments, or Ken, did you want to have us look at anything specifically on that? No, we th that's that's our standard uh, set of guiding water principles. We like to include them with the bylaws just so the board can 
uh, A, see them every year, but B, uh, right before the legislative session, it's good. Our, our legislative principles really stem from these guiding water principles. So it's always good if um, we wouldn't change them today, but if you know any board member, once you've read them and looked at them, if you have any thoughts on it, then, then uh, you know, we'd be happy to entertain uh, looking at those, bringing it back as a formal um, uh, project. If not, um, we're fine the way they are. Okay. Any questions or comments on the those policies? Um, just one comment. When I reviewed them, I think just in general, they, they make sense. We're working on, um, I think staff is working on some things that are pretty specific. Um, you know, one that was striking me is under conservation, we have a, a goal or a, a policy statement. That we're trying to stay 10% lower than current projections um, for water demands. But we also have the, the city's um, sustainability or climate action task force. And, and I know we've tasked the staff with trying to kind of determine what's attainable in that regard of conservation measures. And it, it may just be one that as we get feedback from that, you know, ultimately in the future, we may want to update that policy statement um, to correspond with what we get as feedback from what's attainable or what level of conservation we feel is, is appropriate. So th there's just a few items like that where I think, you know, this is kind of what we've done historically, but we've got maybe a few projects or a few um, things that the staff is studying that may change that in the future. So anyway, th that was just one that caught my eye. Um, so maybe we can just go ahead and leave those as is, but then if, if we do get find additional information um, from that, for example, that study, we can update that in the future. But any other questions or comments? Marsha, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say about the Climate Action Task Force. I, mean, I think that one was uh, universally set aside, you know, as a, an unsupported outlier. And, um, oh, hi, Francie. Um, so I think we would be in, uh, we would be um, glad to hear about what a, you know, a, a, an attainable worst case scenario might be, but I think everybody understands that um, you have been pretty cautious in your recommendations to date. Um, so it's not like we're finding that there's a hole in the plan or anything like that. Probably Francie should weigh in on that as well. Sure, go ahead, Francie, if you wanna chime in. Yeah, and I just wanted to clarify, uh, just in terms of timelines, um, in the recommendation to city council that was approved on how that climate action task force recommendation should be adjusted, um, we propose that the study would begin in kind of timing of the 2024 water efficiency master plan update and return to city council to evaluate more ambitious goals. So that probably won't begin until 2023 would be. Um, so we're probably two years out from beginning that more extensive study. Okay, that's fine. Thanks for the clarification. Um, so I guess bottom line is we'll analyze that and then determine what what is um, the potential or what can we do as that study is done, that makes sense. So any other questions, comments? Okay, so I guess the, we'll leave the um, guiding water principles as is um, at this point, unless anybody has any problem with that. Okay, um, with that, we are on to um, item 10B, which is a review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Um, Ken, do you have any comments on that? I have none, no. The, the one item I, I would put in there, and it I may I guess it may fall under item 12A for future board meetings, is we talked about Save Rain Left Hand Water Conservancy District. Um, they're doing a stream management plan. They're trying to do the implementation, and they're going to come back to us in March or April. So I guess my only comment would be to stay in touch with Sean Cronin um, so that after they get that determined, we can get a, a presentation. So we're kind of on the same page as them as to, you know, what they're looking to 
for in terms of implementation and specifically how the city would fit into that. Very good point. We'll, we'll include that and talk with Sean. Okay, Thank you. that sounds good. Um, so we're on to 10C, which is a re resolution of appreciation for Ray Petros. Um, Ken, maybe I'll have you kind of give an overview of, of that. Um, we talked about it and I suggested we, we maybe do a resolution um, given the, the time and effort that Ray has, has put in and the things items he's helped the city along with. Yes, thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, and and I guess for me, this is a little bit personal, personal as well. I've worked um, with Ray for over 35 years uh, of, of the time he's been here. Um, Ray really started uh, even before the city did its first major um, water rights transfer cases. We have a, sit, a set of water rights transfer cases. We call them our 81 transfers. They were, um, actually, if you, you go clear back to 1929, we had transferred a, you know, some Longmont supply and uh, Palmerton water, just a real small amount. But really since then had, hadn't, you know, we had water rights, but we hadn't really, gone through a transfer process. And we got a lot of water rights in the 60s and 70s. Uh, none of them had been transferred. Um, so Ray really helped, uh, as well as um, Bob Brand, um, really um, helped put together the city's first major water rights transfer cases, um, of which we then were able to model our other transfer cases over the years. Um, he also helped uh, guide us through um, all kinds of uh, issues uh, surrounding our water over the years, all the, you know, Windy Gap, CBT, uh, gas and oil, uh, uh, gravel mining and, and our first ever gravel mine augmentation plan for Sandstone Ranch and just a myriad of, of, of things over the years. Um, that really helped move Longmont to uh, forward and, and helped us get one of the most dependable water supplies along the, the front range of Colorado here. So, so I really do appreciate all his efforts. Ray has, at the end of this year, at the end of December, um, fully retired uh, and turned over his firm to uh, some of the other um, junior principals I don't know if they turned it over, sold it, but it's now now different, even named differently. But um, he's now no longer our water uh, special water council after over 40 years of providing service to the city. So I just thought it would be uh, fitting to just send him a resolution, uh, thanking him for all the work that many years and really helping Longmont uh, move forward with an extremely uh, dependable water supply. One comment I would make is, you know, we talked about earlier Union Reservoir and Wes, you gave a, a little overview of your ability to move water into Union, move it up into Button Rock. And, and I would just say, you know, I'm a water resource engineer. This is the kind of, I do some of this work for a living and having that flexibility is no easy task. So I assume, Ken, when you're alluding to what Ray has done for you guys, that's a kind of testament to that of that flexibility and, and having that flexibility is invaluable um, in terms of managing your water supplies. So anyway, I just want to bring it back to something we talked about a little bit earlier in the meeting that that, that has immense value to the city. So I don't know if anybody else has any other comments, but I think having obviously 40 years of service um, to the city and you know what, what he's done, I, I think deserves us trying to um, recognize that in the context of resolution. So. Any questions, comments, or any problems with, with that? If not, um, I think we need a, a motion to approve that the resolution was included in everybody's packet. Um, I don't know if anybody had any comments on that. Otherwise, if, if there's a motion to approve the resolution that was included in the packet, um, I'd, I'd <clears throat> like to, to see that if we can. Yes, I move. All right, we have a motion by Allison. Do we have a second? Mm -hmm. No, Kathy, Kathy is seconding the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Opposed? Okay, the motion carries four to zero. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, and Ken, I guess if you talk to Ray, wish him uh, a happy retirement, so. We will do that and we will get this uh, put on some nice, nice paper and get it around for the board to sign. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Um, the next is item 11, which is informational items and water board correspondence. Um, I don't know if the board has anything. There was a couple in the, the packet. Um, I think just in terms of the schedule of the meeting and that sort of thing. So I think kind of standard on that. Um, does the board have any comments, any, anything else they want to bring up at this point? I don't see anything. Um, informational items in water board. Oh, I guess we get, already did that. I'm sorry. Item 12 is items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. In March, we have the cash and lieu review again. And then, as I mentioned, maybe in March or April, we can um, hear from St. Brain Left Hand Water Conservancy District on the um, stream management plan implementation. So. Are there any other items coming up um, that you see on that, Ken? I have none, no. Okay. Anything else for the, the good or the order? All Only right. That February's yeah. meeting is going to be the week after President's Day, so it will be the fourth Tuesday, of, uh, fourth Monday of the month, like right. we did for this month. Great. Thank you, Heather. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.